Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this TU Automotive webinar covering 5G and automotive. My name is Annie Redaway. I will be hosting today's webinar. 5G has the potential to open up all sorts of doors for the auto industry, from enhanced consumer-facing features to improved safety to V2X, and automotive is taking a large role in shaping it and the standards. Um, today, we are lucky to be hearing from three expert presenters. I'd like to introduce and thank them in turn. Uh, Stefano Sorrentino, Master Research from Ericsson. Thomas de Vial, Senior Product Manager at Continental. Frederick Callenrud, Head of Connectivity Strategy and Product Planning at Scania. Uh, so they will actually be presenting in the opposite order from what it says on the screen. Uh, Today's webinar will be interactive, so after we've heard from our speakers, they will be answering audience questions. So please send those through throughout the session. And just to let you know, we'll be sending around a recording of today's webinar to all those who have registered, and you can ex expect to receive that in the next couple of days. Um, but you're not here to listen to me, uh, so I'd like to hand over to our first presenter, Stefano Sorrentino, who's Master Researcher at Ericsson. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I'm just going to show my screen. I hope you can see it. Yes, I hope so. OK, so um, uh, hello, everybody, and thanks for having me at this webinar. So I'm going to talk in this uh, very brief talk about 5G, how the technology is being uh, developed, and how it is relevant for the automotive industry. So let's start by looking at, um, at the main differences between 5G and previous generations of mobile networks. So 5G is being developed already from, from its beginning. Think about different industries and their specific use cases. There are very varying uh, requirements between different industries. Uh, and, and, and use cases. And, and one peculiarity of the 5G system is that it's, it in, intends to address them all, already those that are being thought about today and, and some future ones. And what is interesting for us is that the uh, automotive industry and ITS, uh, intelligent transportation systems in general, are, uh, I would say, one of the really highest priority industries and use cases targeted by 5G. So as I um, explained, um, these use cases are very varying across different industries. So it's really a challenge for um, when designing these networks, uh, how to really be able to address all of them. If we look at traditional networks there, there is a sort of one-to-one -one mapping between different services and physical networks and resources. Uh, this paradigm is being broken for 5G. The idea, uh, there are lots of ideas of, about virtualization, software-defined networks, and so on, that are being uh, um, embedded in the design of 5G, such that we, we see the coupling between hardware uh, resources and, uh, uh, and actually the networks for the different industries. Um, we see virtualization at different levels. At the radio levels, where uh, for even the RAN, the radio access part is being virtualized, partly centralized, partly distributed. We see virtualization in the cloud, where uh, today we have typically centralized cloud, you know, a server in the internet. We will see, uh, for certain use cases, including automotive, we will, hear, we will see distribution of the cloud closer to the radio access to, for example, reduce latencies and uh, uh, traffic load within the core, but also for security concerns, for example. Within the core, we see network slicing, so virtualization of basically core resources uh, and, and uh, improve the separation between different uh, industries that access the core network. Yeah, so this is one of the tools, this virtualization and software defined network that is used to, to really improve the flexibility of the network and address all the different requirements. Now, let's look uh, in more detail uh, about what is 5G actually, especially from a radio access perspective. <clears throat> so 5G is the combination of two different radios, 
The first one is the evolution of LTE, which is, of course, backwards compatible to existing networks, uh, LTE networks. It targets primarily spectrum up to 6 gigahertz, so all the existing LTE bands. Uh, LTE is not dead at all. It's uh, uh, there is uh, actually faster than ever ongoing standardization and improvement in LTE, so we, we foresee that it will be a very uh, likely technology for many years to come. In addition, there will be very tight interworking for this new radio, uh, NR is the name, uh, the official name from 3GPP, which differently from LTE doesn't have a backwards compatibility constraint, so it, the design is more free, it targets basically any spectrum from low frequencies up to 100 gigahertz, so-called millimeters wave. So how, why do we look at this new spectrum? Well, the first is really we need, because the spectrum below 6 gigahertz, is, there is not enough free spectrum to support these new services with very high throughput demands and the bandwidth. But but also there are physical considerations like millimeters waves. The wavelength is very uh, short. It allows to um, basically uh, reduce the, the dimension on every single antenna element. And uh, so that means within a certain amount of space, it's possible to pack more antenna elements. And this gives a certain freedom of multi-antenna processing, which has a number of benefits. Now, very quickly about the key technology features on the radio part. Uh, well, I already mentioned spectrum flexibility, also the possibility to deploy in-band LTE and the IoT, so it's the IoT access for really cheap and uh, energy efficient devices. The new use cases, flexibility in the deployment with virtualization. Uh, um, five, the new radio will still be OFTM based, at least in its basic version. Um, multi antenna transmission, very important component. <clears throat> multi site connectivity, where the same device is being served by multiple sites to improve reliability and, uh, and also uh, range and um, <clears throat> the efficiency and the throughput. Uh, very important for the automotive industry, if we look at the lower right corner, is the direct communication between devices. So some automotive use cases imply a lot of data being directly exchanged between vehicles, for example, and in some cases it's efficient to do this without going via the uh, network infrastructure. So this is supported in the 5G. And the uh, last slide, just, you know, to this very quick overview about how 5G can be relevant for automotive. So I will not go through all these use cases, but just pick here and there. So ITS evolution, all these safety use cases uh, that are already being discussed now, they're expected to be deployed really in the next very few years, but these first deployments are quite limited, and the limiting factor is the technology. Today's technology is not really allowing for the evolution of these safety use cases. With 5G, we believe that we, we will have many new possibilities. Autonomous driving, uh, uh, 5G can assist in different ways, for example, high definition maps, uh, continuous software updates, but even virtualization of some of the functionalities of the car. So that, for example, uh, to improve the life cycle of devices, uh, virtualize some of the de decisions, and so on. Uh, remote driving, uh, uh, use case for specific uh, maybe types of vehicles, but a very interesting one, of course, very demanding on the network. You need the high availability, high reliability, low latency. Uh, platooning uh, is one of the hot use cases uh, with a clear uh, commercial interest uh, and yeah maybe I should stop here I uh, just wanted to, to give you a brief introduction overview about this thank you
So Ani, I suppose I should take uh, the audio and the uh, video now. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Stefano. Um, we've, we've actually started getting some questions coming in, um, so please keep them coming. We'll submit them to our presenters at the end. Um, but now we're going to give Stefano a bit of a break uh, and pass over to our next presenter, Thomas de Vial, uh, Senior Product Manager at Continental. Do you see my screen? Do you see my desktop? I need to share, I suppose. No, I saw it, and now there you go. Uh, okay. Let me sh share my screen now. Can you see my screen? No, it's not so good now. I need to select the one you want to see. Yeah, do you have two screens that you're, you have open? Uh, yes, let me see. Oh, okay. I think uh, it's okay now. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so the question I would like to try to answer today is what will 5G bring to the automotive industry? So you probably know Continental as a major automotive supplier. Tire is the most visible part by general public. And we are doing all kinds of other electronics into the car. But Continental is also a major telematics supplier in automotive after we integrated former Motorola division 10 years ago. And we target to be among the first 5G telematic automotive suppliers. So it's not changing. This slide was it. So why do we need 5G in the car? So 5G, as Stefano mentioned, 5G is not about more bandwidth, not only. It will be very useful for the automotive industry for a lot of different reasons. High bandwidth, automated driving will free up your time and you would like to be in your car like at your home with optical fiber. For example, watching video and all kinds of entertainment, and not only for one user, but for many. High network capacity is about a large number of devices connected. Uh, it, there will be millions of cars, of course, but billions of IoT devices, so it needs a new network structure. Low power consumption is very important in, in the context of electrical vehicle, electrical vehicle, but not only. Always up to date in vehicle system is, yeah, you know that a connected car means more threats, hence the security update to be deployed over the air is very important. It's the so-called FOTA and SOTA, firmware update over the air, software update over the air. Improved safety and comfort on the roads. So with 1.3 million road fatalities each year in the world, it's really huge and there are thousands of lives that we could save with vehicle to X communication, vehicle to everything. And low latency, I think Stefano mentioned a bit, uh, it's critical for safety applications in the vehicle to everything context. So far on improved safety, vehicles will communicate with its environment vehicle to x communication can use two technologies one of it is cellular v2x lt v2x then 5g v2x there are two main modes of communication the direct communication vehicle to infrastructure vehicle to vehicle to vehicle and so on it can be done without network coverage this is very important and it's short range like 400 meters the second the second uh, mode of communication, main mode of communication is vehicle to network to allow sharing of information in much wider area. So let's take an example of how this technology can benefit to a final user. So imagine, I hope you can see uh, it's animated, but imagine you have several cars driving on the road 
and the last one wants to overtake but has no visibility. With 5G, the first car could share its sensors, camera, radars, and so on, to the final car. The road is clear, and the overtaking maneuver can be done without risks. So direct communication can also be supported by Wi-Fi-based technology, I want to mention, the so-called 800211p or DSRC and Continental has been working on this technology for years, 10 years and we are leveraging on this experience on cellular VDUX because it's really um, a technology that uh, is so critical for the final user. So let's talk about the major challenges for us as a tier one and the industry in general. 5G is basically an LTA pro network with new radio, submillimeter wave as mentioned Stefano, and higher the frequency, less mobility oriented it is. And probably not all the frequencies are suited for the automotive. The 5G de deployment is not yet completely clear. Planning wise, there are several 3GPP releases involved. R15, now split in two, till late 2018, and R16, till late 2019. Feature-wise, R15 is more about bandwidth, R16 is more about latency and reliability, and region-wise, the frequency plan, the regulations, the mandates, the governments, and so on. What automotive use case will be supported? What kind of business models would be possible? Because the investments are huge, so the, um, all the industry needs to get their money back. That's uh, a big stake. What are the system impact, impacts for the 5G on car architecture? Stefano mentioned um, uh, the beamforming uh, and on the car architecture, so the in-vehicle processing and the antenna issue is very important. The backend side also the is is a is a quite a challenge not 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 so much at, at continental side of course possibly also different technologies per regions we know that DSRC can be used in some region 5G can be used in other ones so now how continental is answering the challenges so we are doing intense research and development projects to evaluate vehicle impact backend impact. I will come back to the, to the one we just announced a few weeks ago. We are doing early industry engagement, first trials in 2017, May, May with NTT to Como, more in 2018 to come. We are also members of the 5G Automotive Association, 3GPP. We are doing partnership with mobile network operators, with OEMs and chipset providers. Uh, the goal is to influence hardware availability and infrastructure rollout at an early stage. And last but not least, V2X. We are developing both standards, DSRC and cellular V2X, equally to be able to answer diverse market needs. So as you know, Japan is pretty much in advance on 5G with a target to cover the 2020 Summer Olympic Games. And this is why we chose to partner with NTT Docomo for, the, for this world first automotive 5G setup demonstrated in May 2017. And the key findings that we already found are, for example, 5G wireless network is not the bottleneck. The antenna issue will be key, and specifically its integration in the car, which is quite a challenge. In vehicle processing needs to be much faster. Buck haul will be expensive due to high speeds. And, and in the end, the full end to end system design needs to be adapted to enable 5G capabilities. So, as a conclusion, at Continental, we are driving the development for 5G in the car as a major building block for automated driving. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much. Um, th thanks very much for the, the presentation and you, you can now relax uh, for about 10 minutes until we come back to you for the Q&A. Um, and last but not least, uh, I would like to pass over to Frederick Callenrod, Head of Connectivity Strategy and Product Planning at Scania, to give a bit of a different perspective on the topic. Yeah. Thank you, Annie. Uh, and just before starting up with my presentation, uh, a few words about uh, who I am. I've um, been working uh, with our connected services now for quite many years, uh, starting out in 99 actually. Uh, and today I'm head of our strategy and product planning looking into what kind of future business and future services can we see uh, in the automotive areas in heavy transports. Uh, and automated vehicles and 5G technology is of course a quite large part of that. Um, I would like to touch upon two uh, projects that we have been, uh, research projects that we are currently working on and, uh, and draw some of conclusions uh, from those on what is uh, problems and areas that we need to continue work and find solutions in. Um, the first project uh, is a joint project uh, uh, with uh, Volvo cars, uh, uh, Volvo trucks, Scania, uh, Swedish and uh, traffic authorities uh, and Academica. Uh, called Nordic Way, uh, and it's a part of the CITS umbrella. Uh, it's testing cellular-based uh, CITS solutions uh, in combination and uh, or in hybrid combination. So it's not only cellular, but also using the um, Wi-Fi uh, solution. Um, and in the first set of of, of uh, tests, now we are testing. Uh, and the hazard warnings and the weather warnings and vehicle data probes uh, and the same kind of services that uh, Thomas uh, was highlighting uh, for for CITS purposes. Um, we just recently made a quite a large demonstration of the system uh, in in, uh, in the border between Sweden and Norway. And testing out one of the critical uh, parts of this uh, when moving between countries uh, and what kind of latencies and problems is occurring when you're handling, really handling between different networks. Um, the second project uh, I would like to mention and talk a few minutes about is uh, platooning and. Uh, Today, uh, Scania has been working in several different platoon projects uh, over the years, starting up almost 10 years ago. Uh, we've been leading the uh, champion uh, platoon project, uh, and you were also involved in the last year rendezvous of platoons coming into the Netherlands and ending up in Brussels uh, last autumn. Uh, now we are working a lot uh, on the next level and really taking this out to the market in, in an uh, early uh, adaptation phase together with uh, Singapore and Ericsson. We are looking into really how can you deploy uh, vehicles in the plateaus uh, in the real situ uh, business situations. So set up in Singapore is, is that it will be a leading vehicle and two following vehicles that is unmanned and moving uh, containers between uh, or within the harbors in, in the Singapore city. Um, and this year uh, we have been working on setting up the system and testing it uh, uh, here in, in Zertalia. Uh, and working with Ericsson with 5G solutions to really uh, get the re uh, redundancy down in the networks uh, and see what, how can technology be used uh, here. Uh, and then next year, uh, moving it on to real test in Singapore. Um, and 
if we can move to the next slide. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about the aspects and concerns that we can see coming up on those uh, from these projects. Uh, and the first one is is really the interoperability, uh, the problems occurring when we are moving between and communicating between uh, vehicles uh, of different crafts, uh, vehicles of different uh, types, uh, heavy vehicles, uh, personal vehicles, uh, light commercial vehicles, uh, and maybe also uh, vehicles which we cannot communicate with. Uh, and also communication with the infrastructure. Uh, this all need to work uh, seamlessly. Uh, and obviously, there's a lot of standardization work, uh, and possibly uh, we might need some kind of certification uh, authority or agency that can help making sure that uh, this doesn't really end up uh, in uh, everyone like understanding the standard and implementing things in a different dialect. Uh, the second aspect is quality of, of service. Um, quality of service and network slicing will become a quite important part of this. Um, it might be completely okay that, that the movie you, you are watching is uh, uh, breaking up uh, when when you are driving, but, but if the drive experience is starting to break up uh, in your automated weekend, uh, in, we are in serious problems. So having guarantee of services uh, uh, in the different scenarios you, we could foresee, for example, if you're passing the Allianz Arena in, in Munich and the Bayern München is, is scoring and suddenly Everyone is taking a photo and filming anything and sharing it with their friends, and the network goes down. Uh, my, my vehicle cannot get unconnected. Uh, then, another example which we are testing in another way is the border crossing. How can we do this uh, so that we make sure that the quality of service is remaining? This is an aspect we really need to work on and find ways of. Uh, getting quality of service into the uh, reality. Uh, the third aspect I would like to bring up is the frequency and spectrum part. Uh, we know that the, the 5G will be more complex and, and require a lot more frequencies uh, and areas of frequencies uh, than the LTE part. Uh, but it's at the same time, we also need to make make more common spectra available and common um, distribution of this, so we can have a movement between different regions, uh, and that we to have a fast deployment of five G really have uh, less variance and different mod. Uh, mod modern world, uh, models to choose from. Otherwise, it will be uh, very much a nightmare to roll out 5G services, uh, especially in the automotive industry. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to hand over to Annie again. Thank you very much, Frederick. Um, we're just going to do a quick switch behind the scenes as I um, make, I switch to present mode for a Holding slide, so just a second. I have a lot of things on my screen and I'm not the. Oh, Emily, how do I do this? Show my screen. So, full screen. Sorry about this. There we go. Is that working? Yes. <laughs> um, so now it's time for the audience to take over. Um, as they've been sending in their questions, we've actually got quite a lot in, and we can we can come more, more will be sent in um, as we go through. I imagine um, the first one that I can answer. Uh, quite a few people are asking about the um, whether or not we'll be sharing this. This will be sent out in the next couple of days, so don't worry. You'll be able to listen back, take more notes, see the slides. Um, so there are a number of questions coming in. Um, 
comparing uh, cellular V2X and 5G with DSRC. Um, so asking if the technologies can coexist, um, whether 5G will overpower DSRC, and also how um, this will be compatible with, say, cars from the US moving forward. Who'd like to go first? Frederick, you were the last to, to present. Yeah, um, I would say that we, in the beginning, I think we will see uh, and, um, the Wi Fi solution being the first one coming out uh, as the standards are quite uh, set already, but uh, then moving into a in hybrid uh, area. And well, we will see if, if there is a winning standard or, or if we need both standards uh, also for redundancy. Any further comments from Stefano or Thomas? I can't comment. I don't know. Uh, so my my view, I mean, uh, as Frederick says, it's really really difficult to predict how it will be. Um, I mean, 5G will be deployed from 2019-20, and then of course it's going to be progressive. Uh, by then, basically the SRC will be two generations old. So. Uh, our view is that it's it's not real. I mean, it's definitely not a future-proof technology. So probably what we will see is that in some regions there will be an early deployment of DSRC for very specific services, and then in the next years the the new services will use a different technology. Um, probably 5G for the regions that go for DSRC initially, while other regions, probably China instead, is going directly for LTV. Uh, there, uh, yeah, so that is a different baseline, which is already a bit more efficient than DSRC. Uh, another aspect to consider is the um, hybrid solution between different technologies and the evolution. Uh, it's uh, tricky to have in-band coexistence between the SRC and uh, basically either LTV or 5G. So most likely we will need to have a channelization so different channels use different technologies. Uh, it is also true that it's more efficient to evolve from LTV to 5G compared than from the SRC. To 5G. Maybe I can add also one topic. So, uh, in fact, there are kind of two questions in your uh, uh, sentence, uh, Annie. The first question is uh, what about uh, the deployment, uh, the standard deployment? Uh, there are reasons, I think uh, Stefano mentioned that in China they, they are more pushing for uh, cellular V2X. In, in the US, there the, the was kind of mandate or proposal of mandate uh, last year. It's very, <laughs> I mean, it's very uncertain which technology will be first on the uh, on all this area. So we have to be prepared for both technologies. Um, at the same time, the SRC technology is ready. It could go to the market very, uh, very quickly. Um, and cellular V2X, Maybe more future uh, future proof, but still needs. Uh, I mean, the release 14 just have been released now this year, so um, it, it could be that the Wi-Fi technology would be deployed first on the market, then it would be a market standard. So uh, that's <laughs> it's difficult to know and to predict. Uh, the second question was about coexistence of the channels. I think uh, Stefano mentioned a bit. Uh, uh, the, one of the solution, I think 5GA made a proposal uh, recently. To, uh, it's about also separating the channels, uh, one, for, one part for DSRC and um, the other part for cellular V2X. At the end, this is true that uh, it's probably difficult to have both technology working together on the same uh, bands, and we need to find a way for that. Okay, thank you. Yes, you're right. I combined two questions there. There were a number of ones along the similar lines. 
Um, similar, actually, with my next question. These are um, popping down as more come in, but there was a question or two about infrastructure. So whether in existing infrastructure can be reused for 5G? Are we going to need new infrastructure? And what are some of the potential solutions for, for rolling it out to what we have now? I guess maybe that's for me. <laughs> so also for me at least. Uh, it depends what we mean with infrastructure. Do we mean the sites? Do we mean uh, the core networks and so on? Um, 5G deployment will be progressive. It will not happen overnight, of course. It's a huge investment. It will first happen in densely populated urban areas and then it will expand. So for quite a few years to come, uh, we will see basically a very tight interworking with it between existing mobile networks and a new 5G network, or NR access to be more precise. Um, can we reuse the sites? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the frequencies. So when going to very high frequencies, the coverage shrinks. On the other hand, these beamforming techniques can extend the coverage. So one could look at this NR access as a boost local around the site and then where this uh, NR does, if it doesn't really reach for the whole site coverage, then the LTE will step in. Uh, and then at the same time, you can offload the LTE access in the central part of the site. So, so there will be an interplay there. Regarding the core, so there are many different options that are being supported. In the end, the market will define which ones are more, more popular. But I believe the first deployment we will see, it will be a 5G radio access over uh, basically EPC. It's, it's an LTE core network. So this to avoid that operators need immediately to deploy totally new core network and also new radio as well. That would be too big investment and also time to market would extend. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Stefano or Toma, did you have a, a comment to add there? No, I think uh, Stefano <laughs> answered quite completely this one. Great. Yeah, there are, there are quite a few coming in around um, platooning and fleets. So, um, Frederick, if you don't mind uh, directing uh, one at you. I mean, yep. the one that's... Mm, there are quite a few that have come through. So, one was when looking at fleet management systems today, um, I'm reading here, 95% or more of the features are based on very simple services like vehicle tracking, messaging, or dispatching, um, which don't need that higher um, connection. Um, in terms of fleet management, not necessarily V2X, do you see a real use case that will drive fleet owners to adopt 5G services? Mm, very good questions. Uh, well, I mean, there's two things that we get out of uh, 5G basically. It's more bandwidth and faster uh, reduced latency. And for for the fleet management and maybe transport management services that we can see coming out of this in the future, you don't, don't really need that much more lower latencies. I mean, if you know where your vehicle is on the second level, I think it's good enough. Um, and also the goods. Uh, if you if you know uh, the data amount, well, I think we will come pretty long with the LTE bandwidth. So I don't see that really driving um, the need for 5G. It's, it's more of those use cases uh, moving on to automated drive. And as Thomas said, uh, what, what do we want to do with the time that we free up? Uh, what will uh, need to be consumed uh, in the vehicle at the, that time um, that will drive data need um, and at the same time um, 
I would say it's in the automated driver area and for the real driving of the vehicle and communicating about that, that is really the use case for 5G to start with. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think we have time for one or two more questions. So um, maybe, maybe uh, Annie, I can add one comment to oh, sure. the top of Frederick's one. Yeah. Maybe just to realize that you know, in uh, with low latency, there's uh, imagine that you are sending some uh, or receiving in your car some emergency messages from outside. And what do we? What do you do with this? If you are only displaying a message on, on uh, your central panel, first it's a bit distracting, or you'd better, for example, um, displaying this message on the head-up display so that your eyes are not pe uh, kept out of the, of the road. And um, a millisecond latency time is really not an issue there because the, the, the braking uh, reaction time is, is very fast. But, in the context of automated driving and uh, uh, driving assistance and so on, what is very interesting is in when these messages are used by the brain uh, of your car to, to take actions like uh, braking, changing lane, or uh, any emergency uh, action that is suitable for that. So uh, the 5G network is, we know that Yet the, the use case to, to use this low latency, as mentioned, Frederick, are not so clear yet, but we know that it's going in the direction we need. And in, in a way, the 5G network is um, a step forward for, um, is, is providing the architecture for needs that we don't even know at, at this stage. Completely agree. Okay, thank you. So you may have already addressed this, so tell me if you've actually answered this question. I'm combining a couple here. Um, so there's a theme coming through some of the questions about um, managing reliability of, of service and coverage. And um, I mean, the first the first question that came in and that actually I can identify with um, in the UK, uh, 4G coverage is terrible. I mean, how can you assure um, first of all, how can you show 5G coverage? And then someone's added to that question. Um, if you've got a mixed availability of, say, 3G, 4G, 5G along the roads, like how can the car handle the balance of those and, and the services requiring 5G, such as safety systems? That'll be the last question, I think. Uh, maybe if I can start a little bit uh, on that, uh, I mean, just and then hand, hand over to Thomas and Stefano. I mean, this is one of the real problems that we need to solve. How, how you need to have a, a autonomous and connected vehicle, uh, so it needs to be able to work in both modes. It, it doesn't. It need to be able to work also in, in an unconnected mode, uh, but probably would reduce the functionality. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I may add something, or Thomas, maybe you wanted to say something. Um, otherwise, I, I can say like this, uh, I really agree with what Frederick says. I also agree with the question. It's, um, it's a pain point. I mean, we cannot hide it. Um, and uh, I, I think the explanation is very simple. I mean, the operators who deploy the networks and make huge investments, they deploy where there is a business for them, where there is a service. So far, vehicles are not a big you know, revenue stream for the operators. That's why we do not have such good coverage over um, certain roads. But there is such a change going on with lots of new services for uh, for the vehicles and maybe one interesting angle of the self-driving vehicles or semi-automated vehicles and so on is that should there is some traffic related to the actually you know control and safety uh, procedures in the vehicles but we expect a much larger increase of the traffic with the vehicle for actually type of infotainment services <clears throat> which are related to a user subscription and that's an obvious business for the operator. So my view is that 
as soon as there is an interesting business case for the operator related to automotive, they will be very happy to deploy better coverage along roads. This is half of the answer. The other half answer is there are new frequencies being um, assigned all the time and now ITS is pretty high on the political agenda so it's uh, quite possible to think to include some uh, coverage requirements along roads in uh, you know uh, the conditions to to apply for new frequencies by operator especially for the low frequencies with good coverage Any further comments? Uh, maybe a, a final uh, remark on that. I mean, that is one of the reasons for why it's so important that we really get uh, the frequency and, and spectrum question up on the table in the European Union so that we can free up sp uh, spectra and make sure that they are uh, commonly deployed in Europe so we can really have this kind of uh, standardized uh, spectrum use uh, which will help uh, especially the lower bands create the reach great thank you well one one thing I'm learning from this is obviously a very big topic lots and lots of questions coming in of a huge range of things and, and it almost looks like we should be doing a two or three hour session on it uh, let alone 45 minutes but unfortunately we're out of time um, I think before I wrap up, um, for all of the people who, who are sending in questions, I mean, they, they range from incredibly technical to a little bit more um, broad or the kind of business implications. Where should, where should people go for, for more information on this topic beyond, beyond this session? Well, it's... Uh... <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure that there is a single place to look at and the things are evolving very fast so yeah maybe this kind of webinars and, and conferences are probably one of the best places to get updated information blogs I mean company sites I'm not sure what Thomas and Friedrich think Maybe, maybe uh, I think the Mobile World Congress is Health and share the insights thing. and also um, <laughs> to everyone who's tuned in. Um, many of the questions we've addressed today in, in kind of a high level um, will actually be addressing a lot more detail along with other topics at um, T Automotive Conference, uh, T Automotive Europe, which is on November the 6th and the 7th. Um, I'm hoping that some of our, our panelists will, will be there as well. Um, we have discussed it. It'll be in Munich. Um, but for now, on behalf of T Automotive, thank you ever so much to our speakers, Frederick, Stefano, and Toma, Toma. And thank you all very much for listening. Uh, I'll email all of you soon with details on how to access the audio. And uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.